Praise God, praise God. Welcome to everyone tonight. If you are a guest, we welcome you tonight. We're glad to have you. If you're joining us online, wherever you may be watching us from, we welcome you as a part of this service tonight as well. We're glad to have you joining us wherever you may be and pray that you are blessed by what is taking place here tonight. Praise God. It's also good to have Brother Dylan Morgan in service with us tonight. Brother Morgan's third son was here earlier this year to have him. Praise God. 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 1. 1 John 5 and 1. Whoso believeth that Jesus Christ is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that be and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Good old King James. <laughs> there was a preacher that preached Friday night before B Bishop Bernard preached. Uh, he was from New Orleans and uh I think he's originally from Venezuela, I think is somewhere in his, he said, I'm going to read from the NIV. He said, I speak two languages, English and Spanish. And he said, I don't speak King James. So <laughs> good old King James. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. And His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever, here's the reason why, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. The Amplified says verse 3 this way, for the true love of God is this, that we do His commands, keep His ordinances, and are mindful of His precepts and teaching. And I, I, Surely nobody tonight needs to be reminded of it, but maybe somebody comes across this in the future. Just in case you miss where we're at, we're in the New Testament. We're in the New Testament. And James says, or excuse me, John says in the New Testament, we are to keep his ordinances, be mindful of his precepts and teaching. We haven't done away with how we're supposed to live. And these orders of his, not suggestions, not recommendations, not hints, these orders of his are not irksome. Not a word you hear every day. They are not irksome, burdensome, oppressive, or grievous. These commands are not burdensome. They're not oppressive. They're not grievous. I'll preach to you for a little bit tonight on this subject. Obligation or opportunity. Obligation or our opportunity. Father, I thank you for what you have already done here tonight. I am confident, I am certain, God, that you have already worked and moved in this sanctuary tonight. And so, God, not simply out of obligation or ritual or habit, but in faith that you have put something in my heart for tonight, I pray, God, that you would continue to work and move in this service and that you would now, God, speak through your word that we would hear a word from you tonight. Again, God, I'm, not, I'm asking you that it's not a sermon, but it's a word that would come from you. I trust you and depend upon you tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. These orders of His are not irksome. They are not burdensome, oppressive, or grievous. Is it an obligation that you are fulfilling? Or is it an opportunity that you are stepping into? 
Jameson Fawcett and Brown says this with regards to the statement or the words, not grievous. Not grievous as many think them. It is the way of the transgressor that is hard. It is the way of the transgressor that is hard. And this week, and I don't know, I, don't, I know that there are folks in our area that are unfortunate to be homeless. I don't know what all the dynamics of it are that cause this to be the case, but it seems to me in this immediate area, I realize if you're from Baltimore, in Baltimore it would be a little bit different, but in this immediate area, you're not all that noticing of homeless people, but... It seemed to me, and I said it to someone else this past week in Indianapolis, and they agreed, it seemed to be there was an exceptional number of homeless people on the streets of Indianapolis that we passed by throughout the week. Can I tell you tonight, I know some of you are struggling with some things and you're going through some stuff, but the Bible says, and it is true, it's the way of the transgressor that is hard. As difficult as you've got it tonight, and some of you got some challenging situations, I'm not taking anything away from that, but it's not the way of the saved that is hard. It's the way of the transgressor that is hard. Don't let the enemy trick you into giving up this for what is what will end up being harder than this. What makes them to the regenerate not grievous is faith. Did you hear that? It is faith that makes the commandments of God not grievous. Why faith? Because I, ha I should have some expectations. Not that my obedience is causing me to be worthy or deserve something, but that my obedience is positioning me for something. And so by faith I do what I do, not to earn or deserve, but there's plenty of places in Scripture that let me know clearly, if I will do my part, God will do His part. In proportion as faith is strong, the grievousness of God's commandments to the rebellious flesh is overcome. The reason why believers feel any irksomeness in God's commandments is they do not realize full by faith their spiritual privileges. I know that's wordy, but one more time. The reason why believers feel any irksomeness in God's commandments is they do not realize fully by faith their spiritual privileges. My faith that leads me to obedience opens up opportunities. But if all I'm doing is fulfilling an obligation, I have no faith. So I do not experience the fulfillment of what my obedience is supposed to lead me to. Isn't it amazing we expect God to be less of a parent than most of us are? I, I've told, I'm sorry, this is, this is the nature of being a preacher's kid. You have to learn to deal with it. The privilege of becoming a preacher is you get to do to your kids what your dad did to you. So, I, I've told Timothy the last couple of months, as he is, was approaching 16 and now into that phase of being able to pursue getting a driver's license, even though, man, it's a lot harder now than it was a couple of years ago. And I've told him, and I've told him, I said, I'm telling you this to be fair to you. I want you to know that I am watching you in every area because I am determining your level of trust so that in a couple of months from now, if I'm just going to give you a key to go somewhere in a car, I need to know that I can trust you. So when I give you rules for a phone it's not just rules for a phone i'm trying to see can i trust you because if you won't turn the phone off at 10 o'clock you're probably going to end up driving someplace you shouldn't be Amen. 
And yet we do not want to prove to God our trustworthiness, but we want him to just give us the keys. The son is no different than a servant, though he be heir of it all, until he proves his trustworthiness. I'm not doing what I do to earn something and deserve something, but I'm also not doing it simply out of obligation. There is some stuff, forgive me for putting it that way, there is some stuff I am reaching for, and I know that part of the pathway to get there is my obedience to what he wants and to what he says. And so by faith, not because it's a burden and a weight, You prove where you are in your relationship with God when the only question you ask is, what do I have to do? Spiritual maturity goes beyond what do I have to do. It's not a matter of what do I have to do, it's what do I need to do, or how about this, what can I do? Hebrews tells us to lay aside Every sin and every weight. It does tell us those two things, but that's not the order. We don't ever get to the weights because we're too busy arguing about the sin. Is it really sin? Show me. Prove to me. To the mature, the writer of Hebrews says... Lay aside every weight, first of all, weight. What's a weight? You know the problem with a weight? There are some things that are weights for Brother Middleton that are not weights for me. I've been checking all day. What are the Orioles doing? Is Boston beating the Blue Jays? And is Atlanta beating the Tigers? And how is the U.S. doing in the Ryder Cup? <laughs> you don't know what the Ryder Cup is, I don't have time to tell you. When I'm sitting in the 515 meeting, and as soon as I'm done with the meeting, I'm anxious to one more time before I come into church, just double check and see. That could potentially be a weight. While a bunch of you, you don't even know what Ryder Cup is. Ryder Cup. What in the world? Doesn't matter to you. Orioles? What do the Blue Jays and the Tigers have to do with that? has to do with the fact all three of them are fighting for two wild card spots. Wild what? That's not like Uno. That's not what a wild card is. Doesn't mean any color. A bunch of you have no clue, could care less. What is a weight to me may not be a weight to you. That's why, part of the reason why we don't compare ourselves among ourselves and judge ourselves by ourselves. And to those of you that think you have a call on your life that God has something special for you to do beyond the ordinary, if you don't start worrying about your weights and quit comparing to everybody else's, you will never reach everything that God has for you. In my opinion, the reason the order is weight and sin is we need to be challenged to give up the weights. It ought to be a given that we let go of the sin. I'm going to say it again, not to be unkind. There's a bunch of you. You've got it in reverse order, and you can't even get in to figure out what the weights are because you're still arguing over whether or not it's sin. When I have faith, and I've got expectation, and I have confidence that I have a purpose, His commandments are not grievous. They're not agitating. They're not burdensome to me. 
Listen to Barnes' notes. He says this, the word for Greek, the Greek word for grievous is heavy. That is, difficult to be borne as a burden. The meaning is that his laws are not unreasonable. The duties which he requires are not beyond our ability. His government is not oppressive. It is easy to obey God when the heart is right. Let <laughs> me say that again. It is easy to obey God when the heart is right. It's not original, so I can say that's good. And read it again. It is easy to obey God when the heart is right. And those who endeavor in sincerity to keep His commandments do not complain that they are hard. All complaints of this kind come from those who are not disposed to keep His commandments. Indeed, they object that His laws are unreasonable, that they impose improper restraints, that they are not easily complied with, and that the divine government is one of severity and injustice. But no such complaints come from true Christians. No such complaints come from true Christians. They find His service easier than the service of sin. They find His service easier than the service of sin. I, I think, and I, I said it this morning, I've said it a couple times recently, I realize how blessed I've been. I've had folks through the years, you just don't know how blessed you are. You know what, I got a pretty good idea. I realize how blessed I've been to have been born and raised in the church, to have been born and raised in an apostolic home with two godly, wonderful parents. I understand that. And there have been a few times I've heard some people talk about their past that weren't raised in the church, talk about their past that I, I weren't, wasn't quite sure if they were expressing thankfulness over their past and being delivered or if they were gloating over their past. Because there have been a few times it sounds like I heard a little bit of, of, a, of a missing But I do think sometimes we need to remember the pit. I, I, I've heard it said, and I think it's true, your worst day in the church is better than the best day you could ever have in the world. Your worst day in the church is better than your best day in the world. Because don't forget, on your best day in the world, you were a sinner who was lost and going to hell. And on your worst day in the church, you are a sinner who has been saved by grace. And hopefully your hope is not in this life only like other men who are most miserable. But you've got hope that I do not look at what I see because what I see is temporary. It's not going to last, but I look at what I don't see because that is eternal and that is going to last forever. They find his service easier than the service of sin and the laws of God more mild and easy to be complied with than were those of fashion and honor which they once endeavored to obey. The service of God is freedom. The service of God is freedom. Sorry, those of you that were here in Arnold this morning, permit me to say it again tonight. The Bible tells us you are a servant of one of two things. And some of us think we have three options, God, the devil, and ourselves. You are not in the multiple choice options. You are either the servant of sin unto death, or you are the servant of righteousness unto life. You are going to be a servant. And the service of God is freedom. The service of this world is bondage. 
No man ever yet heard a true Christian, a true Christian, a true Christian say that the laws of God requiring him to lead a holy life were stern and grievous. No man ever heard a true Christian, or let me say it this way, a true disciple. No true disciple thinks or feels like God's commands are grievous, are a burden, are wearisome. Because a true disciple understands, I am doing this not out of obligation, but what I am doing is going to provide me some opportunities. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. But in keeping of them, in keeping of them, there is great reward. It's not an obligation that I am fulfilling tonight. It is an opportunity that I am participating in tonight. I am not here tonight out of dread. I am not here tonight out of duty. But I came here tonight not because I was the pastor and had to be here. But I came here tonight because sometimes I know that when my steps may well nigh slip, if I can just get in to the sanctuary of God, if I can just get in the presence of God, there is an opportunity for things to turn around. Even if my world doesn't change, my perspective will change. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great, great Great reward. Obligation? Are you kidding? Duty? Responsibility? Burdensome? Irksome? Sunday in the fall. For many, it's the month of their God. It's the months of their God. Football. Football is, like any, is not like any other sport. You go to a baseball game. Most people go to a baseball game in time for the game. The game's over. You leave. People that go to football game. I mean, the people that really go. It is an all-day affair. And those that really love it, to give it up, to go to church? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. Because you got a 50-50 chance of a good day. It don't matter how good your team is, every now and then they're going to lose. And there's some, it's, it's sad, you know, if you really, if that's your God. I mean, there's some cities, if you're, if you're the home team fan, you, you might ought to consider leaving, moving, getting a new home team. Because you start the season off knowing we have no hope. We are not going to win. We can deceive ourselves into thinking there's some kind of a chance, but there's no chance. I realize a lot of you are blessed that you could care less. And, and I know if you're that way, you don't, under, you don't understand. I'm, I'm not quite that far. I'm far enough that I kind of refuse to, to watch the Ryder Cup. That's a golf tournament. I keep referring to it, so let me help you out. That takes place every two years where players from the United States play players from Europe. It's a three-day event, and it's, you know, it's kind of for pride. Guys that all year long 
compete against each other one way, now become sort of enemies for a weekend because it's about your country. It's been eight years. It happens every two years. It's been eight years since the U.S. has won. They have had this pattern of just melting down. I was looking yesterday as we were sitting in the airport waiting on our flight, and they were doing all right, and they looked like they had a chance. But, you know, I'm like not ready to get invested in it. I understand some of you are like, are you really, Brother Ryder? You, you need to grow up. Listen, I'm, I'll be 45 next month. If I ain't grown up yet, I ain't growing up. And I ain't trying to grow up. I knew I, I didn't want to get emotionally invested and disappointed and frustrated. So I just kept looking at updates. Oh, looking good for now. Because if you got your trust in humanity, if you got your trust in human beings, you, 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 that's pretty frail. But I come here every time I come here and every time I gather with the people of God with the certainty that something can happen. That if it doesn't happen, it's not somebody on the field's fault that I have no control over. The bottom line is, if nothing happens, it's not his fault. It's my fault because he tells me, if you come and believe that I am and that I am a rewarder of those that diligently seek me and you'll mix my word with faith, then I'm going to do something. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. According to all that David his father did, he removed the high places, he broke the images, he cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord departed not from following him, kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. That is what he did. That is how he lived. But he didn't live that way as an obligation. He understood it was an opportunity, and here is the opportunity. The Lord was with him. And he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza and the borders thereof from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced cities. He understood that if I will submit myself to what God wants and do what God wants, I can expect that there are some things that are going to happen in return for our, my obedience. And so I'm not going to do this out of our obligation. I'm not going to do this because I have to. I'm going to do this because I want to. Because I know that if I will do this, God is going to respond and do his part. I've come to preach to some folks tonight. Would you get beyond the obligation of what you're doing in your walk with God and realize that God is providing you with an opportunity for exceeding abundantly abundantly Above all that you could ask or think. What do you mean do I have to do this? My response is do I get to do this? 24 and a half years ago, I gave up the right to talk to any female that I wanted to talk to. Single female. To be safe. 
I gave up that right to commit to one lady. How many billions of females, single females, are there in the world? I'm not worried about what I gave up. I'm too much in love with what I got. What, what do you mean give up? I know what I got. If you're struggling tonight with all that you're giving up in the world, you've missed out on what you got. If you're so caught up with all that you're sacrificing in the world, you have so missed out on what it is that you've got. I've got the great I am. I've got the ancient of days. I've got the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. I've got the great I am. I've got the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I've got the provider. I've got the deliverer. I've got the way maker. Give up. Give up? Are you kidding? Obligation? Are you kidding? I have stepped into an opportunity that is so far above anything I could ever be worthy of or deserve. He said it to the children of Israel, Exodus 19 and verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, and then, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. I preached it several weeks or months ago now. He gave them a whole list. You do this, and I will do this. You obey me here, and I will bless you there. Obligation? Really? Really? Ladies, obligation to dress the way apostolics dress? Obligation? Obligation to give up some stuff we give up? Are you kidding? What about the opportunity that we have been provided? Not going to give up going to a football game with a 50-50 chance that your team will win. Just as much chance, not willing to give that up for the opportunity to lay hands on somebody that's sick and call on the name of Jesus and watch sickness leave somebody's body? You call this an obligation? First Peter 2 and 6. I guess it kind of ties into what I preached a couple of weeks ago about glory. So let me just say it this way. And I guess it's kind of connected to that. But you and I are God's outlet for showing off. You and I are God's way to show off. First Peter 2 and 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be dis disobedient, the stone which the builders disallow, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. But you, somebody say that's me, but you are a chosen generation. You, I can't help all the garbage that's going on today and what else is going to go on. The flip side is, in the midst of it all, you and I are a chosen generation. Like Mordecai said to Esther, we have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this where sin abounds. Grace... 
where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I wonder what would happen to our attitudes, just our attitudes. If when we started looking at the sin and all the things going on in our world, if when we saw the sin, we thought, well, there's a lot of sin. But if there's a lot of sin, somewhere there's a lot of grace. Because according to the word of God, where sin abounds, grace you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And I don't want to be peculiar. <laughs> if a diamond ring on a girl's finger that just got engaged could talk, that diamond would tell you, I am glad I'm peculiar. There's a parking lot out there, Brother Whaley, with a bunch of rocks in it, isn't there? Bunch of rocks. Bunch of rocks. Bunch of rocks out there. Can you imagine what would have happened 26 years ago when I went to propose? If I'd have gone out there and got a rock? That's what you call it, isn't it? Boy, look at the rock on her finger. If I'd go out there and get a rock and get it mounted on a ring and given it to my wife, Would you marry me? What I what? <laughs> but it's a rock. No. Those newly engaged ladies that suddenly get a spirit of worship like they never had before. <laughs> Try to figure out how to get it just right in the light so we can shine and sparkle. That rock is peculiar. Its value comes because it's not common. If I got some rocks out there tonight and went downtown trying to sell them to folks for a couple of thousand dollars as a rock, I'd get arrested because they would think I'd surely lost my mind. The value of a diamond is its uniqueness. You and I are like diamonds. We are a peculiar people. We're not odd. You know what? We live in it. Give me a break about this stuff as apostolics being different. You ever walked around the mall? My wife, I don't know that we're, we're real, real, real foodies, but my house is becoming foodies. F-O-O-D-I-E-S. That means we're into food. If y'all don't know it, when it comes to food, I am not my father's son. When it comes to food, I am my mother's son. I don't mind Burger King for every now and then. But I want food. My dad, y'all, he, he may be watching. I'll get in trouble. Y'all know that, that, that statement he makes every now and then about, you know, if he's sitting at a nice restaurant with Mother Wright, that's because she knows he loves her because he don't want to be there. So that's, I wish I'd have thought it. Next time I hear him, hopefully he's not watching so he won't hear this. Next time he says it, I'm going to say, well, my wife knows that when I'm sitting at a nice restaurant with a menu that I love her because I want her there sharing what I'm about to partake of. <laughs> Why am I saying all that about food? Oh, I know now. When Elizabeth was going to Denver last year to do an internship, and Esther and I did a little road trip with her, they, which I was very happy that they did, mapped out our trip based on places to eat, based on the Food Network. <laughs> One of those places we stopped at was in Indianapolis called Three Sisters Cafe that had been on diners, drive-ins, and died with Guy Fieri. We ate there last year, and I just figured my wife, since we were going to Indianapolis, needed to eat there this year. So we went there Monday when we got there for lunch, and we went there yesterday for breakfast because it really was breakfast that it was all about. We we're sitting there, and I'm looking around at the people serving the tables. Like, where are we? 
we're, we're not so different anymore. We don't stand out so much. There's too many standing out for us just to stand out. But we have been called and given the opportunity and the privilege to be a peculiar people. I, I don't mean to be unkind, and, and I know this is, could be taken totally wrong. I usually, I don't know if my wife knows the extent of this. I usually go at least once a week to the Amish market. I don't think she knows I go that often. I actually, most of the time I go and I, I overcome the temptation to get a pretzel dog. So what I usually go for, best smoothie in town. Best smoothie in town. And I got to tell you, they are a peculiar people. They do stand out. But I don't think they quite have the benefit of what Peter was saying because the reason we are a peculiar people is so that we can show forth the praises of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Listen to the Amplified, it says it this way, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchase, special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of Him who have called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You have been invited with the opportunity for God through you to show forth His wonderful deeds. Message Bible. You are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do His work and speak out for him. Now, I know there's a time we need to witness. We need to speak. But I don't think what that's talking about is just our words. That speaking out for him, Paul says we are living epistles. Our lives are a living message to you about who he is and what he does and what he's all about. And so he says that we are God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Anybody tonight, God has made a night and day difference. And the devil wants to come along and get us to think about the obligation and make it irksome and burdensome and wearisome and frustrating when God has set that up simply as a means for us to step into an opportunity for what He has for us. I think I'll preach to at least a few folks tonight that it's time for you to get past obligation and get your eyes on the opportunity of what God is inviting you into by your faith that is demonstrated in your obedience to His commandments. Perhaps one of the greatest struggles for young people growing up in the church is the enemy wants to cause you to feel like it is so grievous to live for God. It's so burdensome to live for God. You're giving up so much. You, yeah, you are giving up so much to live for God. It is amazing all that you're giving up to live for God. Heartache. Pain. Addiction. Brokenness. 
destroy lives. You sure are giving things up to live for God. Really? No. No, I stepped in to an opportunity. How many years ago was it, Mike, now, at that youth camp? Eight? Eight years ago. He's getting too old. He's losing count. Sister Kim, you might need to help him. Eight years ago. Eight years ago that heading into his senior year, gave up natural opportunity. Let go of an exciting year of sports. Potentially, most exciting year of your life to that point, sports-wise. Gave it up. Walked away. Man, what an obligation. I ask you, eight years later, if you had to go back, and you could, if you could go back and do it again, what would your choice be? Same choice every time because of opportunities that you now have experienced because of obedience. Opportunities that have come. The problem is, I don't think I can give this all in a great theological explanation or dissertation. I'm just going to tell you simply the way I think it is. When you do simply out of obligation, when all you're doing is out of obligation, you never get to experience the opportunity. And all you're doing is what you have to because you have to. You never get to the place of experiencing all the opportunity that God has for you. But when you decide, you know what, this is not obligation. This is not grievous for me to have to do this. This is simply the path God has laid out for me to get to some opportunities that God has in my life. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, when you do that and you follow God's path, the opportunity always makes up for what may have seemed to be simply an obligation. Would you close your eyes for a moment if you would? I know it's getting kind of late. Realize it's kind of past our normal dismissal time. I don't, maybe there's a, I'd like to just, really, I'd like to just dismiss you. That's what my flesh wants to do. But I don't feel that release yet in my spirit. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to make a, I want to open this altar in a couple of different ways. I want to open it to somebody tonight that maybe all you're doing is living out of obligation. All this is at this point is obligation. But the Spirit of the Lord is inviting you tonight to get beyond obligation, to respond and do what you do by faith so that you can have the opportunity that God has for you. I invite you, if you're in that condition tonight, to take a few moments to come to this altar and talk to the Lord. Perhaps there's some tonight that you've you've pretty much gotten past obligation and you've started tasting and you have even experienced opportunity but seems like the enemy just some seems to come by every now and then and try to get you to refocus on what is expected and required and what God has asked of you and make it seem to be grievous that you need to get back to a place tonight of remembering this is an obligation 
This isn't grievous. This isn't a burden. This isn't wearisome. This isn't an unreasonable weight that has been put on me. But this is simply the means to an opportunity. name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. is done working and touching some folks but if you need to go if you want to go you're free to go God bless you please be respectful mindful of those that are still praying look for in his wonderful face oh and the things of this world will grow strange in the light of his glory and grace oh just turn your eyes upon Jesus oh look for in his wonderful face 
things of this world will grow strange and dim in the light of His glory and grace. Oh, turn your eyes on Jesus. Look for in His wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Turn your eyes Look for in His wonderful face This world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Look for. In His wonderful face And the things of this world Will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory and grace Strange. 